Warning. The topics discussed in this video deal with many areas that may be sensitive in nature to some viewers. All content is copyright protected to Swords of St. Michael Lay Ministry and Father Chad Ripiger, Ph.D. To contact or support Father Chad Ripiger at the Society of the Most Sorrowful Mother www.dolorens.org This information is presented for education purposes with the express intent to aid the viewer in understanding spiritual warfare based on Thomistic teachings, deliverance, current church practice, and the office of exorcism. Peace and good. Sister Farah, OFS, OSDE. So they, can, they possess part of the body. They only possess the whole of the body if the person has given themselves over entirely to the demon. It is entirely false that you have to give consent to the possession for it to happen. I know about half the people I've seen that have been possessed have never done anything to give consent to the possession. It is also false that you have to do something evil to become possessed. As I was mentioning earlier today, the three ways in which people become possessed is by committing a mortal sin, which is an open door, any mortal sin whatsoever, or something gravely disordered happens to you, or purely the will of God. Those are the three ways that you can become possessed. There is also another partial and full distinction made in relationship to possession. People are partially possessed, very often have periods of lucidity where they're totally normal. They can carry on jobs, they can function normally, a lot of people don't even know they're possessed. They might think a person's a little odd from time to time, but generally they kind of like the person or they don't see any problem. Whereas full possession, then what happens is the demon, the demon is in control all of the time. Whereas a partial possession, the person has periods of lucidity, but then there's periods where the demon takes complete control over it. There is also another misconception that when the demon takes over, it looks like Linda Blair in The Exorcist with her head spinning around. That is not very often, in fact, in 99% of cases, that's not what diabolic manifestation actually looks like. In fact, one time, I was assisting an exorcist because he asked me to come take a look at a case he was working on. And it's only because I actually had a case of this myself that I actually realized what I was looking at when I saw this one. The way we were about to start an exorcist, the exorcist was trying to communicate or to talk to the woman and get her convinced, okay, we need to start this. And she starts whining, no, no, I don't want to do this, I'm tired of this, I'm sick of this, it's so painful, why do we have to keep going with this, why does God do this to me? This same old stuff, right? And it, it, what I saw in her was it, it, there's a very subtle form of manifestation that can occur that um, if you're not an experienced exorcist, you're unlikely to recognize. So I walked up behind the exorcist who was taller than me, which is not even difficult to do. Walked up behind him, and she was standing in front of him. I sit behind him, I said, that's not her. So I stood behind him, began the solemn ritual of exorcism so that she didn't see it. Immediately he went full blown in the manifestation. Later, her husband comes to me and says, do you mean to tell me all these years I wasn't talking to my wife? I said, probably not. <laughs> So um, this is something to kind of keep in mind. So sometimes people can be fully functioning. I mean, I, I know I know a woman who suffers from manifestations rather chronically, and people don't even know that she's demons manifesting. I can look at that. Oh, there he is. All right. <laughs>